There is a wealth of history dating back to the early part of the 19th century in North Carolina's most visited state park, Fort Macon. Built after the War of 1812 to defend Beaufort Harbor, its main role in military history was played out in the early years of the Civil War. North Carolina forces captured the fort on April 14, 1861, more than a month before our state seceded from the Union. One year later, federal forces were able to conduct a successful siege and recapture it. What visitors see today is a remarkably well-preserved example of this type of fort. This is one of the few surviving examples of forts that have retained their character as when they were built. You see in these forts either brick or stone construction, uh, arch ceilings always because of the weight considerations, thick walls of course which are what saves you from artillery fire or bullets and everything and protects your men. Uh, in the case of Fort Macon, though, this fort is unique uh, in, in some respects. Uh, it's one of the few forts that is buried in the ground. Um, many of the forts in uh, the later 19th century are built entirely above ground. Fort Macon is a one-story structure built into a hill, basically. It mattered little which side a soldier was on. Life at Fort Macon was, after all, like any military outpost, regimented and often monotonous. A glimpse of this truth survives from letters home and from sketches by a Union soldier stationed at Fort Macon after it was recaptured. You wish to know how we spend our time? We have to get up at quarter past five in the morning and have our beds, have made, our beds up. made up and rolled up by six. At six and a half six, we have to drill for an hour and then get breakfast. We then have nothing to do till 10 when we have to drill again for an hour. Drill again at five in the evening, dress parade at six and a half, six, and then supper. Answer the roll call again at nine o'clock and have all lights out by 10. Daily diet consisted of peas, bacon, bread, and biscuits. Brackish water was collected in cisterns for washing laundry and for weekly baths. Drinking water came from shallow wells dug outside the fort. Enlisted men slept in bunk beds, two to a bed. Officers had a bit better quarters. But outside the military routine, there was often little to do. When I'm not drilling. I'm generally sleeping, reading, or studying military tactics. On Sunday, we have no drills and generally have preaching once, sometimes twice. I spend the day generally in reading Spurgeon's sermons or the Bible or sleeping. The salt air makes me feel sleepy nearly all the time. I keep a regular journal every day. Early in the war, Union forces decided that Fort Macon was a worthy prize. The fort was designed to defend against attacks from the sea, not from the land. Union commanders took advantage of Macon's vulnerability and sent troops to entrench into the sand dunes and place rifled guns on the land side of the fort. However, they too had their own set of disadvantages to overcome. As it turned out, the Confederates uh, burned the railroad bridge at New over the Newport River between here and New Bern. And until that bridge was repaired, uh, the Union forces couldn't get their baggage and equipment down here. So that was a big setback. They were living in tents. Uh, it was in April, it was springtime, it was rainy, it was yucky, it was disgusting, a lot of wind, and they were suffering as a result of it. They had a great deal of trouble ferrying over heavy cannons and ammunition and stuff because uh, the sound, Bogue Sound, which they had to go across, was very uh, shallow. They could only go across at dead high tide. And then once they got over on the island side, uh, they had extensive areas of marshland that they had to drag these massive cannons through. By the spring of 1862, the Confederates had considerable reason to worry. April 9th, 1862. Dear Mother, we are entirely surrounded by the Yankees. They are in possession of Beaufort, Moorhead, and all the country around Fort Macon. We have been expecting for some time to be attacked, 
but if they do not attack us in a few weeks, I don't think they will attack us at all, as I think they will attempt to starve us out, which will take some time. I send this letter by Lieutenant Cicero S. Primrose, who intends to go down in the coast to Wilmington in a small boat. He runs great risk in doing so, as he has to pass one of the enemy ships, which lay very close in shore. But as he is going to leave here in the night, he may be able to pass the Yankee ship without being seen. Give my love to all my relations and friends. I am very well. The formal siege of Fort Macon began on the one year anniversary of the firing on Fort Sumter and the beginning of the war. After having been surrounded, capture was only a matter of time. There was no uh, ground assault against Fort Macon. The battle here was strictly an artillery bombardment at long range. Union ships did fire on the fort, but were driven off in fairly short order. The Union troops dug into the sand dunes, however, were able to use the rifled artillery to great effect. They were able to shoot through the walls of the fort. By 4.30 in the afternoon, the damage was very severe. The fort had been hit almost 600 times, and uh, the walls were cracking, and one of the fort's gunpowder magazines was endangered. So the Confederates were faced with a very dismal prospect. They were about to be blown up by their own gunpowder. What could you do? Give up or blow up and obviously they surrendered. They had to, there was no choice. On April 26th, Union troops became the new occupants of Fort Macon. They quickly found conditions at the fort to be much the same as that described by the Confederates. We have to get up at sunrise and drill from half past six to half past seven, from 10 to 11 in artillery, and from far to five in the afternoon with dress parade at six. We have to go on at night for two hours and then sit up two hours before we can go to sleep. Then we get to sleep what time we can in two hours, then go on guard. In the afternoon, we have to patrol the island up five or six miles and get back at retreat. When venturing outside the fort, the biggest danger was snakes. When Ira and I went on patrol, we killed two snakes, one of them an adder. The other one was a large black snake. The boys killed 12 copperheads. The duty is hard, but we live better than we ever did before. We have soft bread nine days out of 10, and it's tip-top bread, baked here in the fort, and we get it warm. Fort Macon's fall helped to mark the end of brick and masonry forts made obsolete by the use of rifled weapons which could breach their walls. Nothing like Fort Macon was ever built again, and this intriguing place remains a window into a time gone by. When you come here to Fort Macon, you have to look at these walls and think of all the things that have gone on here. You can try to imagine, man, if I was a soldier here, this is what I had to live in. This is how I would have lived. Because of this, uh, that's why we have the life that, and the freedoms and everything that we do today. That's what I hope people will take away when they come visit Fort Macon. <laughs> <laughs>